code? Is there a concept of code, or is it just reading its transition table? Uh, I haven't really told you what a Turing machine is yet, but it can't look at its own code. It can take input that represents it can take input that represents itself. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it can look at its own code. But it can't, if you don't give it itself as input, then it can't look at itself. Um, the same way your program couldn't, I suppose. I mean, you can send your program into itself as data, and it can compile itself. Mm -hmm. A Turing machine can do that. So you can represent a Turing machine as a binary string and send it to other Turing machines to check things about it. Like, um, like you can check if a Turing machine you know, has three states or not. You, know, you can check if a Turing machine um, accepts a particular string, except when you try to check that, you might run forever. All right, so decidable things are sets that you can make Turing machine programs for or write programs for, and they always stop and say yes or no. They never mess up. Those are decidable things. You've seen a lot of these problems. Undecidable problems, you'll notice there's another level. Not even partially decidable. Undecidable problems are sometimes called partially decidable. You can kind of answer them. What's an example of a problem that's undecidable or, or what we call partially decidable? A problem that you can kind of say yes when the answer is yes, but if the answer is no, you'll never figure out that the answer is no. What's a good example of that? Uh, post correspondence problem, halting problem, those are all examples. Let's do post correspondence problem as a particular example. That's where you're given those pairs of strings and you're asked, is there a sequence that's going to make the two uh, concatenations equal? If there is a sequence that makes the two concatenations equal, you can write a program to find it. It will eventually find it and say yes. That problem, the strings, of pairs of strings that satisfy the post condition, that set is partially decidable. Because you can answer yes when the answer is yes, but you'll never know when the answer is no. All right? You can recognize that set. You'll get the answer when, the, when you should get the answer. It's complement. The pairs of all strings that don't have a sequence that make the two concatenations equal the things that are not post-satisfiable. That's not even partially decidable. You'll never find out when something's not going to get those sequences. You might run forever. Problems and their complements come in pairs. Usually one is undecidable, and the other is not even partially decidable. OK? We'll talk about this again. There's a lot of terminology, so I want to give you the terminology. In our book, decidable is called Turing acceptable. He likes that term. Decidable and Turing acceptable are the same. And there's a much more standard term that mathematicians used, which, which, which filtered into computer science, but computer science had another meaning for this term. So it really annoys computer science students. And I think Mike Sipser correctly got, got it out of his book and left it as a footnote. But com mathematicians call this set Dimitri knows, right? I don't know. Recursive. Recursive, yeah. Recursive. I won't even write it clearly, just in case you'll write it down and get it confused. No, it's fine. These are called recursive sets. They do have something to do with recursion. They do, but, but they're likely to make you think the wrong thing. From now on, when I say a recursive set, I mean no more and no less than it's decidable. No more or no less than there is a Turing machine, which looks at a string and says yes or no every single time, one or the other. That's what a recursive set is. Out here, there's another terminology. Partially decidable, undecidable, those are the same. Turing recognizable, I can recognize when the string is in my language, but if it's not in my language, I might not recognize that. I might run forever. These programs are not real programs. They will loop forever, possibly, if the answer is no. They will only give you the answer correctly when the answer is yes. So we don't really like problems that are out here very much because they're hard. But they're better than problems that you can't even recognize. Okay, So there's a little bit of a distinction in these two uh, levels. But they're both bad. They're both too, too hard to do. 
The equivalent to recursive in this level is called recursively enumerable. Recursively enumerable. Recursive, or sometimes RE, short for recursively enumerable. It's just another term for the same idea. Anything out here that is not partially decidable is called not recursively enumerable. The set of all pairs of strings that do not have a post correspondence solution are not recursively enumerable. There is no way you can take one of those inputs and guarantee to say yes when the answer is there's no, uh, there's no sequence. You'll never do it. OK. Part of what we're going to be doing in the next week is talking about Turing machines, talking about what they really are, doing some real examples, talking about how you come up with problems that are undecidable. How do you come up with the first one? Once you come up with the first one, you can do reductions to other ones. And we did some of those reductions for context-free languages. You come up with very practical problems that nobody knows how to do. And it's an interesting result. That's Alan Turing calling. <laughs> you are completely misrepresenting my idea. He says in his English. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of, <laughs> Alan Turing was really a German spy. <laughs> and that's why the British spy. Uh, what a bad imitation. <laughs> I can't do a British accent. I can only do German. <laughs> Passing the blushing test. Here, get that on camera. Uh, so what did he have to say? <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry, I'll go back to my grave now. All right. Uh, inside here, inside the decidable ring, is a whole, whole big area of of science called complexity theory. And it gets divided into numerous concentric circles and overlapping circles dealing with how much time it takes to decide things and how much space it takes to decide things. When Mike Sipser gave his colloquium, he showed a very nice picture of this ring expanded out into all its different uh, commonly talked about classes. But if you, if you go you know, do some research, you'll find complicated diagrams describing the whole hierarchy from here to here. That's what we'll do maybe the last couple days of the class. If we get a chance, we will go inside here and blow it up. Inside here is the P versus NP uh, question. Inside here are time hierarchies and space hierarchies of how much it takes to actually do a problem, not just whether you can do it or not. But right now, we're at a much higher level. You know, it's like that would take a zoom in. But now we're way zoomed out and thinking just whether you can do things or not, and just these very, very basic distinctions in computability and in computation models, rather than the time it takes for a particular Turing machine or for Turing machines in general to do things. We're not talking about that yet. We'll do it later. Just yeah. Why do you like that bullseye diagram? Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should do that. I know, because I think, because this is inside this, right? This is the thing of this is just one big world. So the world of, of, the world of decidable things includes the finite state machine. Well, then I can inherit since you don't use bullseye Yeah, well, I do, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. This is, this is the way it, I've been doing it. Maybe there's a nicer way. I don't know. I don't have a good answer. Uh, all right, so questions about the church Turing thesis, questions about this diagram, the big picture, where we're going, anything? Questions? So a Turing machine, more or less, is a finite state machine, except it's got, well, it doesn't have finite states. It's got kind of infinite states. But it's not really just an infinite state machine. It's not just the same thing and say, well, now you can use as many states as you want. Because how would you write such a thing? Right? You'd say dot, dot, dot. It doesn't make any sense. So you don't just say, OK, well, now I'm allowed an infinite number of states, even though intuitively that's kind of what you're doing. What you do is you say you still have a finite number of states, but I'm letting you manipulate a very long tape that goes on forever, 